thanks, Holger, for the warm welcome. And yeah, as you already heard, uh, I'm will present you in the next half an hour um, around the journey we took and to build the autopilot for the Verica platform. So first, a quick introduction. This slide you've probably seen today already is, this is our Verica platform and all the component um, it consists of. And we today want to look into the, near the autopilot and how we developed it and what it's actually doing behind the scenes. But the first question we want to solve so why do we need an autopilot for streaming applications? So probably most of you who run their jobs in a um, real-time setup or in, in, in a production environment have different SLAs. M mostly it's all about the end-to-end -end latency for a specific throughput. So w when these kind of requirements are fulfilled, you still want to have to save costs into your organization, minimize the resource footprint, be it the number of CPUs used or the number of memory. <coughs> Another pro problem we've seen for a lot of customers is what happens when your uh, application is basically <coughs> exposed to seasonal changes and varying loads. So therefore, I have this example, which is basically showing, okay, we have this curve over time, which is showing the load, which could mean, I mean, you product is running in over the globe and it may may seem that some of the regions or, the, or your customers are having a bigger impact than others and then it, it results over a day in this kind of graph so you now you have two decisions one would be okay i completely over provision my application and just say okay i provision my application for always the peak load which is in terms of your sla totally fine but in the end <coughs> you're not really uh, optimizing your costs in, in your organization because it's quite expensive and not very effective. The other way is to just say, okay, I can live with the back pressure and I can live with events which are not processed in real time because they're like waiting in some sort of storage system until they are processed and you just provision for half of the load and say, okay, this is most of the time that's fine, but in peak times we cannot catch up. <coughs> This is also not ideal because we live in a world where real-time processing becomes a much more important topic. So now this brings us already to um, the, the, the question of this talk. So what is Verica's autopilot doing internally? And I've split my presentation into two different, uh, into three topics there. So the first question would be how to scale. The second will be where, uh, when to scale, and the third will be where to scale to. And now we'll start with how to scale. So how do we leverage Flink and its internal components to scale? Th therefore, I've prepared a short recap. For, so for everyone who's familiar with Flink, this is basically um, how rescaling currently works. So if you have a stateful application and some state, we need to stop your application, write all the state to a distributed file system, and then afterwards, load it again and reassign the state to the new scaled operators. In the picture, it basically says from the left to the right, we start with a parallelism of two and then go up to three, and then we have to reshuffle your data based on the partitions. As probably most of you know, this is a quite expensive operation because at some point the data needs to be sent to the file system and then read again. So it's also a thing which is important for the autopilot that we minimize the scaling steps. Another thing which we compared into our, in, in, in our journey was basically on what kind of granularity we want to scale your job. So the lowest component basically of uh, a job graph in Flink is the operator. The operator is basically um, your, your streaming program, which you write, is compiled to is multiple kinds of operators. <coughs> Now in the picture, in the first example, I, it, it, it's shown that three operators, which are first um, in, this, in a single task, which is this uh, dotted line, then we try to scale up this blue operator because the autopilot has found out, okay, this is the one which is covering the most load. Unfortunately, this has a severe downside because before, um, everything was in a single task, so one thread could easily execute this. Now we are having like four different tasks in the end and um, broke the operator chaining. So we have now multiple tasks 
working um, on each of those tasks, which leads to inter-process communication, which we could avoid before. So this is probably slower than before, even though we scaled up the blue operator. The second way we could think of is task scaling. So we already know from the example above, okay, operator scaling has this severe downside. What happens if we scale up tasks? <coughs> now we have the, um, yeah, the same example as before. So, but now the green task is a single one, so there's probably a shuffle, a shuffle exchange um, between the first two tasks, and we now want to scale only the chained source task, which is, in our example, the red and the blue operator. Now this might look very good in, in the first run, but then if you further look into the problem, which we're now facing is that even though <clears throat> the scaling might be good and our performance also, we're increasing the scheduling effort because the problem which we end up with is that your task slots are not evenly balanced anymore. And in the worst case, this bubbles up to your task managers and then if your task managers are not um, evenly uh, balanced anymore with load, it could lead to severe scheduling problems. So we discarded also this solution. So the thing in the end which we end up with is scaling the complete pipeline. It has also then now the benefits, so everything is now evenly balanced. And the next thing is also, so for an example, if <coughs> we scale up these non-load um, intensive um, operate tasks, it's not really resource consuming, so it's um, also a good idea. So now the question is faced, when do we want to scale? So I've now introduced a mechanism, but we still do not know um, when is the right time to do that. Therefore, the initial one, so the initial utilization, which probably most of you think of is just look at the CPU. So what is the CPU telling us? So this um, basically, if our CPU is going up or going down, it describes basically the state of our application. This is in our investigation showed multiple downsides, especially when you're running in a virtualized environment. So maybe you're on some EC2 instance or something, um, you basically do not really get the real CPU metrics, but the one from the virtualized, which makes um, harder guessing if maybe another, an, another VM is on the same core and therefore um, somehow inducing your load. The other next thing, a uh, flink internal thing, is the async I.O. operator. So if these are used in your pipeline, CPU-based utilization is not really showing um, the exact back pressure because maybe an uh, async, async system is causing this. So in this case, we ended up with implementing the idle time milliseconds per second metric. So what this means is basically um, an operator counts internally how long it hasn't done anything in a second and then returns this method, which is already super ideal in this case. Because there we can just either de derive the utilization, we know, for example, okay, if the idle time, if the idle time um, is like 200 milliseconds, we know, okay, the task is utilized 80% because only 200 milliseconds in a second it idles. Hmm. Now you might think, isn't that the perfect metric and we could just basically take this, use it as scaling indicator and then it's over. So I prepared one example to show what is another problem. So we have our pipeline with the example I described before. We have three incoming records per second and this indicates a utilization of roughly 80%. But what happens now if we just double the load? So we're now at six records per second and the utilization goes up to 100%. What do we do with this information? I mean, we cannot derive directly what is the new parallelism or how much we need to scale up. So we need something different. We need something, another notion, which we can um, relatively over time. This brings us to the second question, where to scale to? So we've already seen that the idle time metric is pretty useful, but we need to use it in addition with something else. So our first idea was basically saying, okay, we can just make um, <coughs> in user configurable input, which is basically a, a probing factor and say, okay, we always scale up by this factor. Th then we check the utilization again. And if the utilization is below a certain threshold, we just scale down again. So in our example, we have again <coughs> two 
records per second incoming, which leads to a utilization of 55%. Then we triple our load, the utilization goes up to 100, and we scale to 2, because that's what the user has given us. Hmm. Unfortunately, it's again not ideal, because even though we scaled up, it's still not coming up with the load, and we would need to scale again. And as we learned before, scale this, we need to minimize the scaling operations to reduce the downtime of your application. So therefore, we uh, went back to the drawing board and um, looked into, so what are the most used sources? Because some of the sources already offer some very good um, connector metrics, which we can leverage in this case. In our case, we use Kafka. So, so Kafka has already this internal metric um, describing the lag. And what is the lag meaning in this case? So in our example, we've seen, okay, our, our application is consuming records from Kafka. And this lag is basically describing the amount of records which are currently stored in Kafka and not consumed immediately. In our case, this would be three. But so we can say if it's a back, we define a back pressure free state. If, if this number is e either stable or zero, because the stable also means, okay, we're not increasing the lag which is currently in Kafka. So this means our application can keep up. So on the other hand, this is now a back. So if your application moves from the left to the right state, it, all, it means that you're basically back pressuring because um, the messages in, in Kafka are going up and you cannot keep up with the load. So we, t we take advantage of this idea and basically say, okay, we can now compute how much we're we cannot process and can direct, directly um, direct to, with our utilization metric to see, okay, how much we need to scale up. So now back to the example. So we have, again, our records per second is two, and initially our, our lag is zero, everything is fine, the application can keep up. Then the lag starts increasing and with, with the records per second of six. The utilization is 100%, and now, since we can see that the lag is increasing, we can compute how much over time the lag increases. And this is exactly the number we need to scale up with. So now the, the application can easily detect this and compute the correct parallelism because we need to, to scale up with three, and it was two in this uh, example shown before. So now we're at a state where the lag is decreasing, and our application detects, okay, we're fine, because yeah, the utilization is, is, uh, is healthy and we haven't over provisioned. So in the future, we will probably um, <clears throat> incorporate more connector metrics because as some of you might have seen, this, so there's a flip 27 and 33 which introduces a common interfaces for sources and these sources will all have some, some generalized notion of lag. So this means we can just take our existing algorithm and not only use it for Kafka, but basically all sources which are based on the new interface. Unfortunately, this, so this interface will definitely land in Flink 1.12. It's already um, in the last steps of finalizing, um, but the community is, uh, is basically working on porting all sources to, to this. So initially, we will probably only have a Kafka source, but this can also change rather soon. <coughs> so to show you, a more, real, a more realistic uh, example, I've prepared this case study. So in this case study, you can basically see, <coughs> you can basically see um, how our application behaves. Therefore, in the first example, I will show you the normal over provision. So this looks from a first perspective, everything is fine. So in the first, on the top um, metric, it is shown, okay, this is our input rate, which we ingested in our experiment. And the second um, line, which is currently overlaid by the first one, is showing what the source met, what the source is determining, how many records it's currently emitting. So everything is fine. The parallelism is at 150, but the exact number is not really important in this case. Our ingestion delay, this is basically how much how long our records are in Kafka, which is also zero, which is perfectly fine. So we are up in real time. Only the utilization is a problem because although at some point during the middle of our experiment, the utilization is good, but most of the time it's rather bad and we're not really leveraging all the components. The second one would be under provisioning. And now we already see like huge spikes especially in the, in the first and the third graph. So, which means, okay, in the first graph we see our application cannot really um, use all the ingestion rate, so it will emit less records because it's back pressuring. And the back pressure is also shown in, di in 
chart three, and there you can see we're having in an ingestion layer of almost four hours. So we're not even close to real time anymore because your application is just under provisioned, but maybe save some costs internally. And how does it look with our autopilot? I mean, this is not probably not the most ideal solution, but it's definitely saving you costs and you don't have to worry about over or under provisioning anymore because your application will automatically handle this. In the end, how does this look like in the Verica platform? So this is now what you can get um, if you're one of our customers and uh, bought the platform. So this is describing, giving you now an insight on the left-hand side. So what are the real numbers about for every source? So every source has different um, different characteristic in, in our algorithm and contributes differently to the algorithm itself. Therefore, we are preparing this nice um, overview with, with which says, okay, how much capacity does uh, the source has, how much we need to scale it up, and how the current status is. And as you heard probably before, we are now introducing um, the Verica platform SQL support with 2.3, and of course, this is also available with the autopilot, with made, which makes writing, writing streaming programs even easier because you can now use SQL in conjunction with the autopilot. Now I'm almost at the end of my talk, and I want to show you the perspectives we are currently pursuing to give you an even better autopilot experience. So the first thing which we definitely want to improve is um, we do not only want to have a horizontal scale, but also vertical scaling, which means so we currently only basically adding task managers to your graph or <coughs> and decreasing the parallelism, which is probably in some of the cases not ideal because it also would make more sense if um, your machines or your VMs have more costs. Then we can just say, okay, we also spawn larger task managers, which is in uh, most of the scenarios better because then you do not have these communication between task managers. And overall, as a long-term strategy, we also want to have this as dynamic scaling for your pod, which basically your task manager is running in. Another thing would be reducing the downtime. So as of now, we just stop the graph as shown before, take the save point, start it again, and create a new cluster, which is not ideal. And we could probably just say, OK, we just add a new task manager to the cluster and then rescale the application. And therefore, we do not have the cost of creating all the components again. Another thing, which we, which is also probably, uh, which was in introduced in Flink 1.11, are online checkpoints. Especially in these cases where you have like high spikes and you're usually seeing back pressure in your application, it can take quite a long time to take the save point. With underlying checkpoints, um, th this issue is basically. Um, Discard it because you can, um, even though you're on back pressure, you can take the application snapshot. So um, this will probably um, be elevated with Flink 1.12 since then it's planned that the default, basically your um, application has a timeout configurable and this timeout, and after specific timeout, if the save point cannot be done, it will be automatically un unaligned. And last but not least, this is actually our capability to say, okay, we're not only auto scaling, but we're an autopilot. Because we do not want to just leave you as, okay, we increase the parallelism or lower the parallelism, but we also want to take over all the tuning of your application. So we want to provide a managed Flink configuration service where you do not have to worry about your, your RocksDB tuning or your checkpointing tuning. We want to take all these actions and make it a better better experience that you only have to worry about writing your programs and not managing them or tuning them. So that's all from my side for today. Thank you everyone for the attendance and I'm now open for questions.